So how many people know the name Flo Hyman? Exactly, Flo Hyman uh, was a U.S. Olympic volleyball player. She, compete, right. she and her team competed in the 1984 oh, Olympic Games and they won a silver medal. Uh, what most people don't know is that Flo competed in Japan professionally and she died suddenly in 1986. And her teammates, in uh, honor of Flo Hyman and to recognize her for her accomplishments, um, basically were the impetus, was the inspiration for National Sports and Women's Day, it was to recognize oh. Flo and her contributions, uh, her life uh, and her legacy. And as a result of that, for 32 years, the National Sports and Women's Day has been celebrating the accomplishments and the feat of women. And so I feel very honored to be bringing this event back under my tutelage. Uh, it's something that we hope to do every year. Uh, we have an all-star panel of uh, some amazing Olympic athletes and soon-to-be Olympic athletes. Um, <laughs> and our moderator, Audrey, will introduce them to you all. Um, before we begin, though, what I'd like to do, which is tradition here at the L84 Foundation, is I know, that, not the panel, because Audrey will introduce you, there's a number of Olympians in the audience, and so I'd like to give an opportunity for all of the Olympic and Paralympic athletes uh, who are here with us today to stand up and you know, give your name, the year you competed, um, and your sport. And I'll start with you, my lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Renata. Uh, my name is John Moffat. I was on the 1980 uh, Olympic swim team that was boycotted uh, due to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and then I was able to compete four years later here in Los Angeles, and I'm currently president of Southern California Olympians and Paralympics Association. Good morning, I'm Jan Palchikov, uh, 1976 rowing Olympian and teammate of John's in 1980 with the Boycott of Games. Oh, and now working with Special Olympics Southern California. I don't, I don't recognize everybody, so you have to stand up for me. Hi, my name is Vesna Jelic. I'm from Croatia, and I used to compete for my uh, national team of volleyball in 2000 in Sydney. At the moment, I'm retired, and I, you know, just come here to meet all of you guys. <laughs> and, she's, and she's a heck of a foosball player, too. Huh? I, feel like, I feel like Oprah. <laughs> Wait, did you guys check out the jacket? What? What time does it Hi, I'm Marilyn White, and I participated in 1964 in Tokyo, Japan. I got a silver medal. Wow. wow. <laughs> Track and field. So you competed with uh, our good friend Donna Deverona. Did I miss? Anybody else I miss? Well, thank you. What? No, there's yep, more. Yeah, there's a lot more. Oh, Wayne said that's it. Well, no. thank you, thank you so much um, for that introduction. Let's give our Olympian and Paralympic athletes a round of applause. Wait a minute, we missed one. Yes. Yeah. Come on now. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeff Williams, uh, 1996, 200 meters, former American record holder. Uh, the gold medal kind of eluded me. There was another brother out there running 19. <laughs> but uh, it's blessed to see you guys here today. So uh, let's have a gay, great day and uh, definitely go women. Go women, we like that. So before I get to, uh, to, our, to Audrey and our panel, I'd also like to uh, recognize a couple of our uh, sponsors, co-sponsors for this uh, morning's event. Uh, women in sports and events. I don't know if anybody's here representing Wise. Wise, so thank you. You want to just? We're about to go Facebook Live with you guys. Woo! <laughs> Hi, I'm Dana Backich. I'm director of social, and we're really excited to be here. So, anybody has questions about membership or getting involved? We have a lot of amazing events for 2008. So, Wise Los Angeles. And this is an organization that helps women in sports and events. So, middle manager women, networking, and really making sure that that we have women representation, not just on the field, but off the field as well, uh, in C-suite positions. Um, and then also, uh, women, women in sports and events, mm -hmm. we're also uh, co-sponsored this morning by the Southern California Olympic and Paralympic Association. Um, and I'm happy to say, uh, for the last two years, this has been their home. And we are partners in, in putting on not just Olympic events, but really events that recognize uh, excellence in sports across the board. And so we're pleased to have your support and your partnership. And then last but not least, um, a corporate sponsor that 
You know, we have this, uh, we had a summit uh, last October and we had a panel called Beyond Photo Op Philanthropy. And so certainly a lot of folks are talking about how do corporations give back to communities, how do they make impact uh, for underserved, under-resourced communities. Um, and we deal a lot with corporate sponsors across the board. And there's one uh, corporate sponsor that has become a very good friend and a partner to the A4 Foundation, um, Verizon, that really puts their money where their mouth is. Um, and they are co-sponsoring and funding this morning's event. So all the food, all the drinks, the valet parking, so that you guys can get here quickly. Um, and I just wanted to say a special thank you and give Eric Reed, uh, who represents Verizon, an opportunity to say a few words. Um, this is the beginning of a long partnership. Um, he really, um, you know, he, he, he embraces our, our campaign, PE is a social justice issue, and our um, work to close the play equity gap. Not just gender equity as it, as it relates to women in sports, but economic uh, gaps, geographic gaps, really giving kids an opportunity to experience the transformational power of sports. And so I just want to give Eric Reed with Verizon a round of applause. Good morning, everyone, and Renata, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Eric Reed. I'm the Vice President of Entertainment and Technology Policy for Verizon. And as Renata pointed out, you know, on and off the field, we need to make sure that the playing field is level. Uh, that includes communities of color and women. And so we really, as a sponsor of the NFL, the WNBA, the NBA, um, IndyCar series, that sponsorship will actually end this year. but. Uh, the bottom line here is we need to make sure that there's equality not only on the athletic field but also in the classroom as we think about STEM and STEAM technology because we are severely underrepresented um, in the uh, technology industry. So I'm glad that all of you are here today. I'm excited to hear from this distinguished panel as well. I know that you guys will have a lot of insights in terms of the work that you're also doing as well. And I want to thank Renata and Oscar and the rest of the LA84 uh, team here for putting on a wonderful event. So thank you. Thank you, Eric. So two quick, two quick final notes, um, and I'll save the best for last. Um, you see that we're in what used to be the library. We've turned into what's sort of a museum. Uh, in addition to the work that we do to fund youth sports organizations throughout Southern California, we also are the stewards of not just the 84 Olympic Games, but really the Olympic movement here in Los Angeles and beyond. Uh, we have one of the largest collections of Olympic memorabilia in the world. Um, we're one of two organizations that I'm aware of that have an, a symbolic Olymp Olympic flame burning in our courtyard. The second is Luzon, Switzerland, uh, the museum. Um, and so what you see is um, representative here on the walls of our collection. Um, so please um, make sure that you uh, sort of tour, take photos. Um, I think we might be doing tours of the house afterwards. It's on the National Federal Historic Registry. And we also have one of the largest collection of sport heritage and Olympic memorabilia online uh, as an online digital library. Um, and the books behind our panel is just representative of sample of what we have. So please enjoy the facility. Um, last but not least, before I turn it over so we can hear from our panels, I'd like to recognize uh, one of a, a group of about 19 people that represent the L84 Foundation Board who has stewarded this organization for 33 years. It is a gift that keeps on giving, and I'd like to recognize Deborah Duncan, one of our board members who is with us this morning. <laughs> Enough for me. Audrey, I'm going to turn it over to you so we can get to some conversation with our panelists. I'm supposed to hand over the mic. I failed in my directions. No, that's okay. I get to be over now. now. Everybody, there's a car under your seat. Um, <laughs> good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I want to welcome our esteemed panelists. So I'll start uh, to my right. We have Brooke Charlton. Yep, just go ahead and clap. <laughs> Ty Babylonia. Candace Cable, <laughs> Connie Periskevin, and our lone gentleman, Rusty Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being here. So to kick things off, and in the spirit of National Girls and Women in Sports Day, I want to direct this question to the ladies of the panel. Um, I want to know how you found your way into your sport and what obstacles you faced as a female athlete. Starting with... Oh, yeah. The, Whoever wants to jump in. You want to start? Okay. Um, 
back in like 1966, I saw Peggy Fleming on television and I was done. Um, <laughs> and I really didn't know what figure skating was. I had no idea um, it was gonna be cold and you were gonna fall <laughs> and kids were gonna be screaming, but there was just something about Peggy floating across the ice that I just, I fell in love with. And um, from then on, you couldn't get me out of the skating rink. You know, I started with, with group lessons and I'm, uh-oh, I'm what you call a rink rat. Um, I was obsessed to the point where I was the one waking my parents up um, early in the morning. Did my mic go off? Early in the morning to get me to the rink in Culver City, which is now a hardware store. But that's where I started. Um, I met my partner, Randy Gardner, in 1968. So this year we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. Wow. Woo. I'm so proud of that. Um, and skating, it, you know, it changed my life. It changed my family's life. Um, sometimes a little scary because it is, it's a family commitment and it's consuming. Um, I, I have an older brother who is actually the natural athlete of the two of us. Um, and he was good at, he was great at every sport. I, you know, I picked one sport, I picked the indoor sport and I, I stayed focused and was just in love with it from day one. Yeah, but it, it's, it's, I have to thank my parents for the support, my brother for the support, you know, it's a family. It was a family it, um, process, yeah. And Brooke, uh, I think your mom is actually in the audience, speaking <laughs> of family. Uh, you're a, an ice hockey player. How did mm -hmm. you find your way into that? Well, I found it by actually going to an NHL game when I was younger and I was just like watching the game and I really enjoyed it because I could literally visualize myself on the ice and like playing the game. That's great. Uh, Candace, you actually didn't find your way into your sports until a little bit later. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, um, I grew up a non-disabled kid, so um, PE was required, you know, a subject every day. We had to play PE and I didn't like it at all. I didn't like the sports, I didn't like the competition, I didn't like any of it. So um, after my injury in 1975 when I was 21, I was in a car accident that resulted in a spinal cord injury and I had to use a wheelchair. Um, I needed to feel like I was included back in the world and I didn't really have any, you know, <coughs> pun intended role models. When I was in the hospital, I was in the hospital for six months, I was in a hospital room with eight beds and they were all men. And so I couldn't even imagine where my place in the world was as a woman uh, until I was out of the hospital and I had gone to something and I, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it had other people with disabilities. And they were playing a new sport called wheelchair tennis. And there was this woman and she was gorgeous. She had the 80s hair, <laughs> you know, was like, like layered and kind of big. And she had this huge smile and she was playing wheelchair <laughs> tennis. And I was like, I want to hang out with her. And I wanted her to be a mentor for me. I wanted her to be someone that I could emulate and just like be vibrant because I felt so lost in the world. Because in, in the mid 70s, there just really wasn't any um, access for people with disabilities anywhere. There weren't curb cuts and things like that. Oh, did we do that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I hung out with Mary, and she really was a leader for me of learning how to get in the world. It was very social, but she was playing sports, and I wanted to hang out, so I started playing sports. And I got involved with a sport that was being invented called wheelchair racing. And I think um, one of the biggest challenges for I think anyone is just lack of exposure and lack of experience in something and preconceived ideas of what we think it is uh, until we actually do it and participate in it. And um, so that's why having her guide me into sports and then getting involved with it, I felt like I was really included back in the world and I had this real opportunity now to build my self-confidence because I think that's another piece for women and girls um, 
and for my own personal self was being able to rebuild that self-confidence back. And so once I started with sports, I didn't turn around. I kept going forward and I started to realize that there was a platform that I had to be able to change the way people saw a disability because it's a little bit different in adapted sport um, because we have to overcome that stigma and stereotype and fear that is around disability with education. And sport is the most amazing universal language. I'm ever so grateful to have had it as a part of my life and continue to be a part of my life. And so um, that's really, like, the thing for me is um, really being able to spread that word about how anybody can be a part of being physically active and how important it is that it grows our character. And good sports hair. I feel like the 80s had really good sports hair. <laughs> and Connie, how about you? Um, let's see, I, I started um, competing in both uh, speed skating and cycling uh, when I was nine or 10. And um, I, at that time, I had no idea really that the sports existed in terms of you know Olympics or things like that. Um, I was skating at a rink and uh, one of the coaches saw me and said, oh, would you like to try speed skating, you know, racing? And I said, sure, okay. I figured the word racing was in there, they must go fast, right? <laughs> so I like to go fast on my skates. We always played tag. And um, anyways, that was my, my introduction to the two sports um, as a competitor um, at that age. Fell in love with it, much like Ty at that point, it changed my life. Um, and you know, I competed for over 20 years, five Olympic games, two sports. And um, I think you know, I started competing at, at the international world level when I was pretty young, I was 15, 15, 16 years old, and that wasn't that common at that time. And um, you know, although speaking of the, the equity issue, um, you know, there, we've come a long way. Um, at the same time, you know, there were a lot of challenges, a lot of things, you know, that I went through. Um, you know, I was, when Title IX, um, you know, late 70s, uh, early 80s, was really coming into, you know, compliance, um, that's when I was starting my international career. So I, I knew it existed. Um, but I was really um, lucky to have um, and be surrounded by a very strong group of women who were a little bit older than me um, and, and world-class competitors uh, at the time. And so they really helped me learn how to you know, advocate and how to have a voice. And so throughout my career, it, we went through a lot, I went through a lot of firsts, um, you know, pushing you know, for um, more women competitions. Um, you know, quite often, especially the two sports were very different. Let me first say in, in speed skating, um, which is rusty sport, you know, we it very much from throughout my entire career, the, the team was competed or, or treated um, athletes, male, female, didn't matter. Um, the same amount of money was spent, the same attention um, with coaching and training camps, things like that was very, at least in my experience, very much the same. Cycling, on the other hand, was, was quite the opposite. Um, and still is today, um, that um, that's where I was surrounded, luckily, by a group of women a little bit older who, you know, pushed for change, more women's competition. Um, not necessarily equal pay, but, but fair pay in, in, in race uh, earnings, things like that. Um, uh, fair treatment, ec ec equal treatment in terms of uh, team selection. You know, it was quite common that, okay, for a world championship or high-level competition, it, it was automatic. There was going to be a full men's team and, and money, time, everything spent toward that. Whereas, eh, the women, they were kind of an afterthought. Okay, geez, if we have, we have a couple good women, maybe we'll send one. Well, we started pushing for, no, we're going to have more women's competition. We're going to have a, a, a women's division, so to speak, so that there's somebody in charge and looking out for our interests. Um, you know, and that led to, you know, having more equal treatment in terms of, you know, that support for competitions, for travel, for training, things like that. Um, so, you know, I think it's still, you know, kind of bringing it to today, I think, um, you know, it's amazing how many 
probably young athletes don't know what Title IX is. And um, I think it's something that we need to, you know, we're celebrating it today, but we still need to, to you know, to back it. And I think it's our job to, um, you know, just as I had mentors who helped me try to figure out that voice, you know, it's our job to, to educate the young athletes of today and make sure they do understand because although, again, we celebrate it, but we still need to keep pushing forward. So I'll end it there. Yeah. And part of that celebration and that fight has to include men. So I'm going to direct our attention to Rusty over here. There are, there are people who are probably wondering why you're here. <laughs> I asked the same question. <laughs> uh, but in your athletic career, uh, there was actually a woman who was very integral to that. So can you tell us a little bit about her and how she shaped you as an elite athlete? I think my story I, I thought was normal and I'm starting to learn maybe it wasn't, I'm not sure why, but um, it started with my mom. I'm, my mother was uh, a big influence in my life. My parents were going through a divorce and she asked me to try speed skating and um, luckily LA 84 was the sponsor of our program. So that's my connection to LA 84 here. Um, but my mom grew up before Title IX. So she was a tomboy, but she didn't have the opportunity. So my mom was my first coach in soccer. Uh, she was the one that took me to all my events in speed skating. Um, but then through my career, oddly enough, and I'm starting to realize this as we talked at a, another panel as well, um, my first major coach, uh, Wilma Boomstra, was obviously female. My national team coach, Leon, uh, one of the best Chinese speed skaters, was my Olympic coach at the end of my career. Um, I had mostly all women coaches throughout my whole career. And I always thought it was normal. I grew up here in North Long Beach. I grew up in a very diverse area. Um, I didn't know any better. I thought that was normal. And until I moved to upstate New York when I was 15, I realized that not everywhere was as diverse as where I grew up. I realized that you know, like Connie was saying, our sport, we were provided women and men were, it was equal the whole time that I competed. So I didn't know any better. I thought that was normal. And I guess I'm shocked a little bit that it wasn't like that for more people. And I'm disappointed that more people didn't have the same outlook as I do. And I, I had strong women in my life to be able to show me that it should be normal. And so that's my expectation. And that's the way I've always grew up and lived life. And to be able to let you know, everybody in the room, that that positive impact that you can have as an athlete, as a coach, on males, it's very important. And I had that. I was very lucky. I did have that opportunity. Yeah. And this is just a, a general question for the panel. Is there, having such prominent women in your life and shaping you as an elite athlete has being able to work with women specifically um, changed you in any way, I suppose. My very first, first coach, her name was Mabel Fairbanks, and you can Google her. She's a legend and an icon. She was the first black coach and really changed the color of figure skating. In fact, we're working on a a film about her and the, the tagline is with with one glide Mabel Fairbanks changed the color of figure skating forever um, she's like my, she was like my second mom she's no longer here uh, in 1997 she was inducted into the figure skating Hall of Fame which was a moment I will <coughs> never forget and it's high up on you know being a two-time Olympian is great and fabulous but seeing Mabel get this honor is at, is at the top of my list. Um, so well deserved, so um, uh, a long time coming for her. She just taught me about strength. She taught me um, regarding color. Yes, I was a different looking when I was out on the ice, um, but she said you have a job to do and you know, don't worry about people talking and the chatter and whatever. You're out there to do a job, you're out there to skate and do it. Whatever happens, you know, afterwards happens. And I learned that at, at an early age. Another um, 
saying she taught me, like when I was eight or nine, was suffer, suffer for your art, which at eight and nine, I, I had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> Clearly, as I thought, well, okay, I get art, you know, crayons and paint. Uh, but once I got out on the road with ice capades for nine months out of the year for four years straight, then I learned what suffer for your art meant. So, um, thank you, Mabel. She just taught me so much, so much about life on and off the ice, and of course my mom. Um, so that those two women are, you know, so, so close to my heart and changed my life. But Mabel Fairbanks, her, her, her recognition, it, it's coming soon, so stay tuned. Her life will be on the screen soon, yeah. And, um, you know, I don't want to be, Brooke, because you are uh, the youngest member of our panel, and, and you started playing sports well after some of our panelists, uh, you know, pioneered their their way through their sport, but hockey is still predominantly male. Um, so, how what role models do you have? What obstacles have you faced specifically? Um, well, role models would probably be like like NHL players or um, players on like the U.S. team. And then it was difficult because when I started, it was kind of hard to skate, but also not many girls were at the rink. But once I started playing and like now, it's much easier. It's kind of come natural because I'm not scared to play against a guy's team. It literally just feels like I'm playing against my team when I'm like on the ice. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, so the Winter Olympics, obviously, around the corner. Uh, but not to, right after that will be the Paralympic Games. Candice, I know that you have a lot to talk about regarding that. A preview for us what sports fans can expect this year. Well, um, I had to make some notes, because uh, <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to make sure that people were able to kind of get the idea behind the Winter Paralympic Games as well as the um, Winter Olympic Games. The Paralympic Games are much smaller in the winter time than the Olympic Games just because there's not as many sports yet that are practiced and quite a few of the Winter Olympic sports don't really cross over into Paralympics. Like we don't, we don't have figure skating yet, mm -hmm. though we could, could be amputees, could even be blind figure skating. I mean, that would be interesting. <laughs> Right? <laughs> yeah. Remember uh, Ice Castles, the film Ice Castles? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She exactly. was blind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's, there's bobsled that's coming forward now. It's not in the games yet, but they have bobsled, which is uh, a group of uh, different types of disabilities. So there's paraplegics as well as amputees that are a part of it. So it's a combined team. Um, but for the games that are coming up in Pyeongchang, which will be March 9th through the 18th, and NBC will be broadcasting it um, on the network as well as online, so you have to check that out. They will have six sports, so alpine skiing, cross-country skiing, and biathlon, which are all three sports that I've competed in in the Winter Games. Then there's sled hockey, snowboarding, and curling. And all six of those sports are really super exciting sports. In fact, sled hockey sells out before anything else, even before most of the Olympic sports, once it goes on sale because it's <coughs> such an exciting sport, like so many of the sports that are out there. So there'll be about 80 countries that will be competing and about 670 athletes right now will be there. And there will be also um, within the motto of Pyeongchang, because a lot of times, again, as I mentioned, Paralympic Games also have a social piece that comes forward in inclusion, to include people with disabilities in the world. And so oftentimes that's part of the mottos, um, part of the slogans and those kind of things. So in Pyeongchang, they have actualizing the dream of inclusion, promoting the games as well as the athletes. And their two words are strength and courage. And the bear, that is the, the, um, the mascot, um, mascot it has some references to the strength and courage of the athletes. And uh, so I really encourage all of you to 
check out the games online and also the International Paralympic Committee's website to really get some background on it because, you know, there are so many opportunities for us no matter what happens in our lives, right? And sports is one of those places where everybody can participate. And for girls and women, I, and I take this personally because I'm a woman, but uh, for girls and women, oftentimes there's just not a lot of exposure to those kind of things. And I know that it's changing, but for women with disabilities, it's still lacking because of um, opportunities with transportation or access physically, but the attitudinal barriers too. You know, really breaking down those fears. So I'm super excited, you know, about the games, you know, being on TV, but also coming to Los Angeles because we have a huge opportunity. And so I'm just, um, yeah, I'm over the top. Thanks. <laughs> Well, that actually leads me to the last question I want to ask everyone on our panel. Uh, this theme of inclusion and fair play and play equity, uh, this really means closing the gap in opportunity for people of all abilities, races, income levels. Um, so I want to ask, uh, and, and Connie, you can start us off, but what, is, what does fair play mean to you? Well, I think in, in one word, I think it is opportunity. It's making sure that there is, uh, there are multiple opportunities for um, everyone in you know, all the sports, all the activities. And I think if we, if we start with that and we have that opportunity, um, then comes that awareness and getting the word out and then, and then we, we have play. Opportunity comes play, plain and simple. Absolutely. Anybody else want to answer? Uh, honestly, I think you, you hit it right on. Um, the ability to have access to sport mm -hmm. and the ability to be out there and, and be able to play is the key. It's the opportunity that um, is available because of, if you guys don't know, by the way, Connie actually um, runs a, an amazing cycling program over at the Velodrome. And so a lot of kids, this is their first coach. And this is their role, their role model. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's opportunity to me. Yeah. And coming back to the you know, 2028 um, and the Olympic Games coming back to Los Angeles. I mean, you have the LA 84 Foundation here and it's, they are providing um, opportunity for the youth in Southern California. And I can only imagine, I mean, what they do now is wonderful. I can only imagine what's gonna happen in 2028. It's gonna be even that much better, right? <laughs> Well, and I'm just going to go back there again, education. You know, really being educated about, when I, when I think about adapted sport, really being able to educate people about disability awareness and break down those fears, those things that people are afraid of because um, disability seems to be a big scary monster to a lot of people and it's just a life experience that we're all going to get and so we have to get on board. Right? We have to get into it. And so I think that education and opportunity together, I think, are two big things that can bring forth more inclusion. <laughs> really, really quickly. Exactly what they said, but also parent support from your parents. Um, you got to have it. And I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for, you know, my father working three jobs to pay for my training and my mom driving me to the rink in Culver City. I mean, so many miles on that 405. Um, so I take nothing for granted, but you know, there are opportunities and skating is, and especially hockey. Hockey's actually bigger than figure skating now. What's up with that? Um, in fact, I'm, wor I'm working with your, uh, the hockey team tomorrow at Toyota Center I'm gonna teach them, the little, the little ones, figure skating and they're gonna give me some hockey tips. So it's, it should be a go. And it'll be on NBC, uh, local news. But yeah, it's, parent support is huge and you can't, we, I can't forget to thank my, both my parents, so. What does fair play mean to you? Fair play means that it's not just one sport for just like males, it's like for females and males and everyone can play, it's like you're not, trying out just one sport and you're like, oh, I don't want to do it. So
So at this time, I want to open up the floor to audience questions. Please keep your questions brief, and anybody on our panel, just feel free to jump in. So not all at once. <laughs> you guys. Yeah. So what are you most uh, looking forward to with the 2028 game coming our way? Now we have four extra years to prepare. <laughs> I, I'd like to start, if you don't mind. Um, Honestly, I think the biggest thing that um, people in this room might not know is the move from 24 to 28 is actually going to help LA a lot. And there's going to be a lot more funding provided for uh, parks and recs and things like that to get a lot more people to be able to sit in these chairs and have the same conversation later. So I think that's, to me, that's the big thing is to see what it provides to the city. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love, I love the sports and love to watch everything, but I think there's a legacy that we hold for the Olympic uh, cities, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I think for me, you know, one of the things that is so unique about this is the first time that we've ever known this far in advance that the Olympic, where the Olympic Games will be. Um, it happens to be in our home city. And, you know, I've worked with, um, you know, I've been in athletics my entire life, nine years old, um, as well as now I teach seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13-year-olds uh, youth cycling. I've never, ever thought of this before. I mean, because in this program, although we have very high-level, national-level junior competitors, champions, the program really, it starts, and the, the core is participation, it's fitness, it's health, and it's all those things we know that sports teaches us. Um, the comp competition part is, is part of it, but the other part is equally as important. So I don't stress every kid that comes into the program, I'm not trying to make a racer out of them. That happens naturally, but I, that's not what I do. But with the 2028 com games coming here, it's the first time I've ever looked at one of my little 10, 12 year olds and went, you, I don't say this to them. <laughs> but I'm looking at them going, oh my gosh, they are the exact, the exact age of who will be potentially, well, they will be the competitors. That age will be the competitors in 2028. Now, whether that child will or not, I don't know, but that age will be. And that's, that's a strange feeling, you know? I mean, it's an exciting feeling, too. So I have to hold myself back and just keep doing what we're doing, how we're doing it. It works <laughs> because I don't want to become the, you're going to be the Olympian, you're going to be the Olympian. But it's kind of exciting inside. <laughs> I'm going, ooh, who's going to be the Olympian? Yeah. Um, so I'm excited because the Paralympics have never been here. So we've had the Olympics three times. And in 32, there weren't Paralympics. <laughs> And in 84, the organizing committee here didn't hold the Paralympics. They held an exhibition event on the track for men and women, um, wheelchair racing, and had the opportunity to compete in that. But in 2028, we are actually going to have an official games here, which is going to be, it's going to be change, it's going to be world changing, really. Because I think Los Angeles has the ability to shift social perspective in a major way to really push the ball forward. Um, I know that Tokyo in 2020 is gonna be doing an amazing job and we'll see if they actually make a social impact because we truly do need a social impact for all people to happen in the world and I really think these games can do it. I'm just, I'm so energized by it. I, I feel like 10 years, woo. <laughs> Who plans that? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this organizing group is going to be amazing. Yeah. Can any of you share a story about changing men, because you're all fighting in a man's world, changing men who maybe didn't consider women to be serious athletes and turning them into advocates? Well, I would say um, during my wheelchair racing career in the early 80s, and 90s, um, there were only a few women. And so we really pioneered and pushed for women's equity at the top, equal pay for first place, but not necessarily depth, because we didn't have the depth. You know, only, 
So of all the people that have acquired disabilities, 80% are men, 20% are women. So you have a lot less women that are going to go into sport, that realize it's there after a disability because they're really just trying to create their womanhood again, you know, their femininity. They're trying to get all that back and create that person again. And so sports oftentimes isn't something people think about, though I think they should. And so during that time, men were the champions for the women that were competing. And they became lifelong advocates after retiring from sport to try to create more inclusion in their communities for women in leadership positions. And so a lot of the men wheelchair racers were really instrumental in promoting women's sport. Um, in general, I think, with, without getting into specifics of, of names or situations, I think what I found um, at different points is maybe where there was, you know, it's kind of changing a, a feeling or, or maybe a little bit of a culture within an organization that, um, let's say, you know, early on in the, the, the 80s and such, it was kind of really Title IX that helped, although, you know, I cycling, speed skating, they're not sports within a university, Title IX still had a big effect. It, 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 it made, um, it gave us that we're, we're pushing towards something, um, you know, something to help back us, and it, it, in a way, made some of the administration step back and, and give it a chance. They had to, maybe, at first, were forced to, um, support this this women's program or something you know at first and then it was the performance of the women the um, well I'll just leave it at that it was the high quality and the performance of the women that ultimately you know started to change the mindset a little bit like oh okay they kind of can actually do these things and they do it very well and it can be an asset to the entire program you know the 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 women, men, they can start being training partners together. And so there are things that happen that change the way the team and the members work together that demonstrated, hmm, this is pretty good. So it started to change the mindset a little bit. Um, oh, go ahead. I was, um, huh? my sport, figure skating, it gets a bad rap sometimes and, um, People don't always take it seriously, uh, but I did a show back in 2006 called Skating with Celebrities, and my partner was then Bruce Jenner, who had to learn, now Caitlin, who had to learn to figure skate. And his first words were, figure skating is not for sissies. So that, you know, that convinced me, because it, it is hard, but we are taught to make it look easy. And I know still figure skating is one of the most watched events in the Winter Olympics. So I know guys are watching and I know they're paying attention because uh, the proof is in the ratings. But that was a really great question. Great question. <laughs> and, and how that, how you are a part of that basketball team outside of, you know, this other thing that you have going on. Uh, well, my basketball season is actually over. Uh, <laughs> we did okay, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I think it, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's, it's educating um, the parents um, as well. And um, uh, it, it's, it's educating the parents and the kids together um, is key. And so it's, it's, again, it's starting with opportunities. You know, what uh, providing those educational opportunities that are going to, um, you know, to do that. So I just wanted to say to that, I, all of you are extraordinary individuals being here, okay? You showed up. That's a big deal. 
And, and I would encourage you to check out whatever is passionate to you. Check out where you can volunteer, where you can learn more about how to get involved, because we need you. Everyone needs you. We need your input, your insights. And, uh, and it all starts with just volunteering. In fact, I'm going back into coaching. I'm going to coach for a volunteer coach for the Angel City Sports. Yeah, and wheelchair racing. So um, there was a need. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go take some lessons and figure out what they're doing now. <laughs> I think Candace said it. I think um, sports aren't daycare, and parents need to realize that sometimes. I think that's the key. My, my family was involved, and the parents need to be involved and help. Volunteer, find what you're passionate about. If it's, maybe it's not basketball that your kid's in, but maybe it's something else that you can still be there. I had so many people in my life that volunteered and gave time and energy to me that didn't have kids, that had kids that weren't in the sport. And looking back at it now, at this age, with my own kids, it's kind of shocking me how, how someone did that for me the whole time, and selflessness. And I think that, to me, I think is, is the key to this. So Candace, thanks for your question. I was actually about to ask about coaching. Um, so uh, Carly Gilbert is the one of six female coaches of uh, college track and field at USC. Uh, so six. Um, Mayor Garcetti is pushing for more coaching in Los Angeles. Um, the city of Los Angeles is looking pushing more coaching. The big question I have for, for the panel is, how do you use your voices to get more women um, to be in the power seat around coaching, not just youth athletics, but college athletics and into the pros? <laughs> how do I use my voice to do that? Um, well, first I got to figure out what's out there, and I have to learn how to coach. You know, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean personally, I need to understand what it is that, um, what needs to happen on the track. I, I did a, a fair amount of it when I was competing, and getting people, getting kids involved, and then adults involved in in wheelchair racing, and then also cross country skiing. Um, but it's changed a little bit since I've been out of it, and so I need to get educated. And and then I think then sharing my message out there to groups and really seeking where, um, where it can be heard you know, in, in different organizations. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, um, but I'm definitely open to suggestion. So <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think one way, you know, what I found, I think I was lucky uh, growing up in that the way, the way I was coached was a lot of, not, not detailed explaining, but I, I guess appropriate explaining along the way. And, um, and then I was expected to also participate as a coach to, to younger ones or less experienced ones coming up. And what that provides as an athlete is, um, and I did that through young age, through my Olympic career. What, as an athlete, that requires you to explain, to think about what you're doing and, and differently. And it helps you be a better athlete. And you're also becoming a pretty darn good coach because of that as well. And so that's how I grew up. That's how I kind of did things. I really didn't know any different. I now find that, wow, I was really lucky because it's not that way in most places. And so what I do now as the director of a program is the same type of thing. The athletes that are coming through, not all of them, but those ones that kind of show that interest and, and, and are going to listen, you know, we're kind of nurturing that um, along the way. And, um, you know, in, at different levels, they're participating as helpers, as coaches, when they're athletes competing themselves or participating themselves. Um, and so it, it, you know, now we're at the point where we have some of our alumni who are coaching with us. They're instructors within the program. So, and they're really good, so it's, it's working. So I think it's that kind of um, coaching that helps nurture that. And then in terms of getting into the different levels, um, more coaches at a higher level, university level, things like that. 
Well, you have to start here. You don't you know, run before you crawl or walk. And so if we're nurturing at the young age and that's done consistently and you're going to end up having more women coaches um, at the higher levels. They're going to go through the ranks. The interest is going to be there. There's going to be more of them interested. They're going to be better educated. They're going to, um, you know, get a, you know, uh, a, a professional education, so to speak, as well, because the interest will be there. So I think that's a one way, a grassroots way of, you know, making it work or seeing how it works and how it can work. Well, thank you, panelists. Um, but before we wrap up, I'm going to pass it off to Renata. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your round of applause. And, and, and if I can take a bit of liberty uh, in terms of, you know, how do we get women coaches in the game? How do we get more girls playing? Um, I think this is what National Girls and Women's Day is all about. Uh, if you can see it, you can be it. Um, one of the things that LA84 Foundation has done um, since its founding is train coaches. We've trained over 80,000 coaches since our inception. So anybody in this room uh, who is interested in coaching their little league team, their AYSO soccer team, their sons or daughters, middle school or high school, um, if you want to go through coaching education, just see Wayne Wilson. Uh, he's led our coaching program since its inception. We've partnered with organizations like Positive Coaching Alliance. We have a convening around how to get more women coaches in a game. So I think to Candace's point, showing up today, um, understanding and embodying what National Girls in Sports Day means, um, spreading that word and getting involved, I think, is a way in which um, we can really con continue to create this movement of closing the play equity gap as it relates to gender. So um, thank you all for being here. Um, thank you to our panel. That was an awesome, awesome uh, conversation. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Um, and let's uh, go uh, USA in the 2018 Pyeongchang Games, which start on Friday. <laughs>